Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to talk at this uh, workshop on privacy challenges in the health sector. So I'm Yves Moreau. I'm a professor of engineering at the University of uh, Leuven in uh, Belgium. And I'd like to briefly talk about uh, the question of genomic uh, surveillance. So DNA um, databases have been very useful in tackling serious uh, crimes. And uh, this technology has developed over the years and now it's basically crossing the boundary between a very focused technique uh, with a specific way of working that can be slightly limited to something that can actually breach outside classical law enforcement and cross into uh, medical and clinical data. And I'll take one illustrative uh, uh, example, the story of the Golden State Killer. So this is a series of, of violent crimes, 13 murders, 50 plus rapes uh, at the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s in California. And um, in the 80s, it, it was not possible to identify the, uh, uh, the Golden State Killer. And in the 90s, a DNA database was uh, a set up in the US called CODIS, where basically you register uh, DNA fingerprints of uh, people who have been convicted of uh, crimes and basically these looks at what we call short tandem repeats so variable regions of the genome uh, for which the combination of 20 or so of these um, uh, loci alleles is essentially unique however when this database was set up it wasn't possible to identify the criminal this person had not been registered in the database and that stays stayed that way in the 2000s in the 2000s and the 2010s and then at the end of the 2010s a major breakthrough came which uh, actually used in fact the dna sample from the crime scene not to go into a law enforcement database but actually to search uh, genealogy databases such as GD Match or MyHeritage uh, to actually not find directly the killer but to actually find relatives um, of a suspect and eventually that's through um, genealogy analysis this led to identification of Joseph D'Angelo as the perpetrator of uh, these uh, crimes and while this is actually obviously uh, exciting that um, the police was able to identify a very very serious uh, uh, criminal actually this also brings forward important questions regarding privacy uh, people who actually brought their dna in the genealogy databases actually didn't do it to solve crimes and also people who can be implicated in crimes actually never volunteered their dna so how do we manage the right balance between supporting law enforcement and protecting the privacy of individuals because obviously in a case like this we might have a tendency to say well solving crimes is more important than protecting people's privacy however there are situations where such techniques are being clearly abused and i'll go and, and discuss quite at length the situation in xinjiang uh, you have heard that there are very serious human rights issues in Xinjiang right now, started about you know, five, seven years uh, ago for a very intense uh, repression campaign against Muslim minorities, specifically Uyghurs and Kazakhs uh, in uh, Xinjiang. And what we have established is that DNA profiling technology, the kind that is used by law enforcement, plays an important role in uh, surveillance in Xinjiang. So what we are seeing there is what we call total 
surveillance. So a system that combines all available technologies, facial recognition, GPS tracking, internet censorship, um, searching mobile phones for uh, irregular documents, so, such as having the Koran on your, on, on your phone. Um, all these technologies are brought together to create this total surveillance system where essentially individuals lose autonomy because they feel under surveillance at every single moment, even even in the privacy of their home, even the privacy, for example, in the case of DNA profiles of their family relationships. So who is related to whom? Well, that's in the DNA and suddenly the state can have access to this type of information. Now, what, what we saw uh, is that, in fact, this infrastructure was actually built rapidly after 2015 in uh, Xinjiang by uh, the supply of this technology by foreign suppliers such as Thermo Fisher Scientific. This is using the older DNA sequencing technology, capillary sequencers, and very specific PCR kits that amplify those uh, loci, the short tandem repeats, and this technology on a huge scale in uh, Xinjiang uh, in 2015-2016 at a level that was not compatible with best police practices which aim at um, profiling a limited number of convicted uh, individuals to actually avoid the risks of uh, false uh, positive, false matches, things like that, but rather uh, the setup of infrastructure that uh, is able to DNA profile the entire population of this region, about 25 million people in Xinjiang, about 10, 11, 12 million Uyghurs, and then uh, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and other Muslim uh, ethnicities, a couple millions. We saw very disturbing uh, things uh, happening. For example, here, that's a scientific publication between scientists affiliated with Thermo Fisher Scientific, where they, in direct collaboration with police forces in China, develop uh, a kit specifically for the Chinese populations, because when you actually study uh, DNA profiles, there are population variations and you need to map that carefully. And then they calibrate this technology specifically on the um, Uyghurs, Tibetan and Hans. So it means that this uh, company was working directly with Chinese police forces to have a product that is optimally um, designed for uh, surveilling, for uh, creating this gigantic DNA database of the entire population of Xinjiang. And we saw some very disturbing behaviors for example, this slide is not mine. In 2016, uh, Gordon Thomas Honeywell, which is a lobby firm working for Thermo Fisher Scientific, was pushing to promote the idea that we should create DNA databases of the entire population everywhere in the world, because of course that allows you to sell more products. And this uh, slide, I, I didn't design it, it's taken over from a presentation for, from Gordon Thomas Honeywell, and it's actually asking uh, what are the difficulties for having these universal DNA databases in more countries across the world. And they asked the question of whether we could see um, all population DNA databases expand to Western countries or other countries with democratic forms of government. And they noticed that there are some significant hurdles, such as the open and public parliamentary process or the culture of being influenced by opposition and protest, which is kind of a disturbing to see that, well, democracy seems to be an obstacle in. Um, uh, uh, selling your products uh, on a larger scale across uh, the world. Um, this problem of the deployment of DNA surveillance technology in uh, Xinjiang uh, actually was taken up 
in the US, sometimes in unexpected places. So um, US senators, in particular Republican senators, uh, even on Fox News, uh, actually uh, brought this matter on to the front of the discussion, uh, actually saying that US companies um, for DNA profiling, Terma Fisher, but in other segments like Google and, and the risk of setting up a censored search engine that actually US companies had a special responsibility in making sure that this uh, technology it does not get abused. And under uh, serious pressure from um, these uh, uh, U.S. Uh, senators and, and uh, members of parliament, uh, members of Congress, actually Thomas Fisher um, uh, said and declared in 2019 that basically it recognized, and this is a very important statement, the, it recognized the importance of considering how the products and the services are used or can be used by their customers. So uh, companies should actually, when they know that uh, misuse, abuse of the products is, uh, is taking place or when they should know that then actually they must uh, uh, take that into account and they must restrict the sale of products that are uh, being abused. Uh, the next steps were actually quite serious. A number of sanctions were imposed by the US export controls at the end of 2019 which means that uh, US companies cannot sell products freely anymore to, for example, the uh, Xinjiang police uh, and the Magnitsky uh, sanctions in the summer of 2020, which blocks um, those entities from doing transactions with US companies. So this is a very serious set of uh, sanctions and that moves the discussion from a claim by a company that it will stop actually uh, selling its products to having an enforcement mechanism that uh, tries to ensure that such transactions do not take place. Still, we recently uh, discovered that Xinjiang police forces were still buying products for Thermo Fisher and one of its competitors, uh, Promega, for this DNA profiling, DNA database in Xinjiang, despite those export controls and the Magnitsky sanctions, which are very serious violations of uh, uh, US uh, laws. And so in the coming months, we might see further development on uh, these uh, questions because uh, violations of US sanctions is very serious matter for the US administration. Of course, I focus on my personal experience in looking at what has been happening in Xinjiang. That's not at all to say that this is a uniquely specific problem to Xinjiang. Actually, the problem is happening on a very large scale, maybe slightly less intense across China. There is a very large male DNA database program that is being uh, developed uh, in other countries. For example, at the US-Mexico border, refugees are being DNA profiled and put in DNA databases, which is just that they are uh, criminals, which is actually not the case. Uh, migrants do not have overall a higher criminality rate than the regular uh, population and so this this creates forms of stigmatization and discrimination that should be stopped. So although the scale of what we are seeing in Xinjiang is unparalleled, there is nothing in the world that rivals this level of surveillance, that doesn't mean that the problem of surveillance is limited to um, Xinjiang, it's actually one of the major questions of our times. How do we uh, defend personal autonomy and avoid being constantly controlled by authorities? Now you could say, well, you know, I'm a scientist. Uh, I work in uh, uh, academia, in, in, my, in my case. Um, these are products that are sold by companies. Uh, we as academics do not have a direct responsibility uh, 
in what is happening and and there I want to actually give some important caveat because what we have seen is that scientific activity in this area is very intense it's very close uh, to actually the development development of products and potential abuses and so uh, we looked into the literature that has been published on what we call forensic population genetics uh, of Chinese populations. So forensic genetics, that these are the techniques that are used typically by law enforcement. For example, these DNA profiles using short tandem repeats or whatever kits that is available now. And population genetics is actually studying the characteristics of a given or several populations. You actually need that when uh, in fact you want to properly calibrate uh, a uh, um, DNA profiling system because uh, probabilistic stochastic variations, uh, statistical variations between populations make that when you want to compute the probability of a match that is actually population dependent. So every time you bring a new kit on the market you need to calibrate it to the different populations in which you want uh, to use it. And so what we looked at were all publication on profiling one of the ethnic populations of China using those techniques that are the same as those used by the police, uh, what we call the, our baseline. And then we actually looked in this set of publications uh, for those where at least one co-author was affiliated by the police, the judiciary, to the uh, judiciary, or some uh, related institution. And then we, within uh, uh, this set, we also looked at those that were targeting specifically the most vulnerable populations of China, Tibetan minorities and Muslim minorities, Uyghur, Kazakhs, Uyghurs, and others. And what we saw was extremely disturbing. So in the past uh, decade, actually in half of all uh, publications that study at least one Chinese ethnicity and calibrates the technology, there is a quarter from Chinese police forces. And in about 15-20% uh, of those, that's actually a study that targets extremely vulnerable group, where a quarter is actually a member of the police forces that are persecuting those uh, groups. So the conclusion is that it's actually impossible to carry out this type of research in China uh, independently from public police authorities. We saw that the, the focus on these uh, minorities was extremely intense. Those minorities represent only a small fraction of the population, about half a percent of the Chinese population for Tibetans, about just under 1% for Uyghurs, and yet these were studied in respectively 17% of all the papers or 21% of all the papers we were seeing. If you actually compare this to the majority Han population and make a ratio that actually takes into account the size of the population, you would see that Uyghurs are 30 times more intensely studied and Tibetan 40 times more intensely studied than the Han uh, majority group, mean, meaning that there is an intense research focus on those uh, populations. We also saw that uh, the collaboration with police forces was extremely intense. So this is a graph of co-authorship between institutions. So the size of a ball represents the number of publications published by one institution and the uh, size of a, the thickness of a link shows how often those two institutions co-author a paper. And so you actually see there that indeed it is not possible to carry out scientific research and be a major player in this topic without uh, intense collaboration with uh, police uh, forces in China. The problem extends further, so we have had much debate uh, on the database of male DNA profiles, so Y-STRs are profiles that characterize the Y chromosome and that allows to actually not identify necessarily uniquely an individual, but uh, identify their 
paternal lines, so uh, actually men that are related by father-son uh, link share the same Y chromosome and thus uh, an identical or at least very similar uh, Y DNA profile. And we saw that in this database in Germany about a third of all profiles were coming from China and 15% of those were from those most vulnerable populations. So a lot of very sensitive uh, data was actually contained in a database uh, located in Germany. To give an idea of the, how problematic this can be, the main publication by these research uh, teams from Germany uh, on male Y-DNA profiles from China had many co-authors, about a third of all co-authors were affiliated with uh, Chinese police or similar institutions, meaning that basically when you develop this database, the first people who are interested in trying to use the database that you've made available um, that is directly uh, useful for uh, law enforcement in China. Obviously, law enforcement needs these kind of tools. The problem are uh, the availability of safeguards that guarantee privacy, autonomy, you know, uh, um, basically uh, fair trials and not the exploitation of this technology that is meant to catch the worst criminals as a technology that allows uh, you to control entire populations. That's not what this technology was ever meant for. We saw very serious problems on the ethics of those publications. Is it possible to consider that participants who are from persecuted minority, who are researched by researchers involving the police or the judiciary, that they actually can formulate free informed consent, which is a basic publication requirement. Uh, we saw ethical committee approval that was coming from the police forces. So the Police forces have their own ethics committee approving actually studies. We saw some journals with very shady behaviors where uh, journals that have been publishing like OncoTarget, which is a cancer related journal, published this type of studies and, and then uh, sometime later it lost its impact factor. And very recently at the journal Molecular Genetics and Genomic Medicine, we actually um, realized that uh, a journal that had never been published this kind of study suddenly became the journal that was publishing the most of those studies and basically uh, in, we had discussions with the publisher and things didn't move forward very uh, quickly and eight editorial board members have uh, resigned very recently. So a core problem that we are observing is that the publishers are very reluctant to retract these kind of studies. We speculate that this is because um, the Chinese market is an emerging market for publishers and that uh, actually getting in trouble with Chinese authorities by retracting a significant number of papers is uh, really problematic. But we cannot accept that because this would be uh, uh, compromising the basic uh, ethical values of scientific research. And so what we're now seeing is that there are processes for reassessment of papers that are ongoing, but some of them have been ongoing for over 18 months now. So it, doesn't, it seems that this we're kind of stuck, frozen in, in time and not able to move forward with actually retracting uh, prop, uh, papers that are highly problematic. And now to conclude uh, uh, briefly, I want to bring forward the question of yes, but what's the wider significance? This is technology for law enforcement. So what is the link with actually our practice? I'm a specialist of identifying genomic variation causative for rare uh, genetic disorders. What's the link between that and this type of technology? And uh, the thing is that, of course, with the, the having next-gen sequencing getting cheaper and cheaper, we are sequencing more and more people. Uh, and so uh, databases that are medical databases uh, become increasingly uh, interesting for law enforcement and they might want to get access to those. And we might consider that, yeah, because of privacy rules, um, these uh, 
uh, database are beyond the reach of uh, 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 law enforcement, but that's actually quite wrong. So with a subpoena, for example, in the US, HIPAA uh, regulations does not uh, uh, typically prevent the police from accessing data in a medical database, which raises very, very complicated and thorny questions. Of course, you could say, yes, but if this data can be used to solve a crime, why shouldn't we have access to it? But imagine, for example, a criminal would decide to withhold treatment from his children because he's afraid that the data, the genetic data of their uh, children would actually reveal who he is and land him in, in prison. So, so the, the, the confidentiality, patient phys physician confidenti confidentiality is a very important uh, uh, baseline in medicine and it's much, much more important than we typically imagine. So when people cannot trust, they can freely go to the doctor, then really bad things happen, epidemics are spread, uh, uh, care is withheld from criminals or from their family, and we, we really quite uh, simply don't want to go there. Also, uh, because the technologies that we're using in healthcare become relevant, for, for this, big stories can start emerging and, and maybe the spin is not always optimal, but we will have to take these type of stories into account. So this week, a story came out about BGI and how its subsidiary Nifty was collecting uh, DNA profiles, so shallow sequencing DNA profiles for the diagnosis of uh, uh, trisomies during pregnancies and the story spin was that uh, BGI is collecting uh, DNA from mothers and their unborn uh, children uh, and putting that in a gigantic database in, in China. And, and while the facts are certainly very concerning, there are important reasons to be concerned about the privacy of, of participants. The, the way that the story is presented is really quite aggressive and might actually hurt uh, a medical research in the near future. We have a number of options. I don't have time to go uh, in, in them, but uh, for example, federated and privacy preserving analytics where data remains on the control of patients and their physicians is not centralized by the state, it's not distributed all across the world, uh, could certainly help us continue to do the best research and provide the best medical care without compromising the privacy of, of patients. With that, I'd like to, to conclude with a few basic uh, uh, messages. Uh, we need a lot more corporate accountability. You cannot sell your products if you know that they are being abused. We need a lot more academic accountability. The entire field of forensic population genetics uh, research on Chinese populations is ethically suspect. Tens or hundreds of papers need to be uh, uh, retracted. Um, uh, not only researchers uh, are in question here, but the role of publishers and editors is, is uh, crucial. And if we are not careful, this will quickly become an existential threat to biomedical uh, research. Our community needs to come together to find solutions, to explain to the world what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, before we get very emotional reactions like what we saw with, with vaccines, where it's now next to impossible to have a balanced uh, uh, social discussion on the issue because trust has been lost and maybe has been broken or lost, but here we certainly want to avoid this at all cost. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, people a student of mine who did all the bibliometric analysis, my collaborators at Human Rights Watch and several uh, others across the world who all start tackling those questions of privacy, surveillance and, and, and DNA. And now I'll be happy to take uh, your questions. Thank you very much for your attention.